More and more people all over the globe being exposed to sustained heat. Let's take a closer look at the medical risks. When the weather heats up and stays that way for days or even weeks on end, it can be hard for the human body to cope. Those who work outdoors, poorer people in rural communities, and the elderly are just some of the groups at particular risk when the mercury climbs, especially when humidity is also high. The first signs of heat-related health dangers include headaches and nausea. If the body loses too much water and electrolytes through excessive sweating, it can lead to what's called heat exhaustion, marked by a drop in blood pressure, dizziness, and disorientation. If the victim isn't cooled and rehydrated, they can fall into shock and experience life-threatening heat stroke. But aside from detectable symptoms, sustained high temperatures can have more subtle effects, like incognition. Studies have shown that when external temperatures rise, oxygen levels in the blood drop, and the less oxygen the brain has, the less able it is to think clearly. That's exacerbated when nights are hot, too. People who sleep badly are more irritable, less focused, and generally worse at remembering things. Excess heat even affects moods and mental disorders. It causes changes in levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin, for example, which is linked to anxiety, depression, and aggression. One possible explanation for why violence becomes more common during heat waves. So, punishingly high temperatures can have major impacts, not just on physical health, but mental health as well. To talk more about the impact of heat on our mental health, I'm joined now by Robin Cooper. She's an associate clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco. She's also a member of the Climate Psychology Alliance. Welcome to the day, Robin. Some of the phrases we use every day suggest a link between heat and having a bad temper. You know, we have my blood is boiling. We feel all hot and bothered sometimes. We tell people to chill out. Is that just a coincidence? That is not a coincidence, and it is absolutely clear that our colloquial language tells us so much about what we all experience. We are cranky, we are irritable, we are moody, and we're much less able to apply our normal restraints on our behaviors when it's extremely hot, mm -hmm. particularly these heat waves that you've already outlined. You say that hot weather makes people cranky, angry. Is there then a link between hot weather and crime as well? Absolutely. Irritable, cranky, I don't have a whole lot of patience, but we know that there is increased interpersonal violence, not violence um, on property violence or that kind of, of uh, violent changes, but interpersonal violence. And that um, increases particularly for people who don't normally have, uh, don't have good restraints on their behavior when they're cranky. I am particularly concerned about the increase for women and children and those vulnerable in domestic uh, relationships where there's an increase in domestic violence. Um, there's also increases in rape and, and just like road rage and um, kids on the, the, the sports field get into much more scrapes. So there's absolutely increases in crime and increases in the way people treat each other violently during extreme heat waves. Research also shows a correlation between extreme heat and increased suicides. How can we explain that? Well, actually, absolutely the same. And I think about um, it's suicide like aggression turned toward the self. And there have been a number of studies that show us that there are significant increases in uh, suicide due to extreme heat alone, even though it's a complex behavior. And that um, one of the studies, the researchers out of Stanford, projected that there could be an increase in 21,000 um, suicides due to heat alone in a year, wiping out all suicide prevention programs and policies for gun controls, which is such a big issue in the United States. Striking predictions. We talk a lot about winter depression. Is this a summer equivalent of sorts? It's a heat impact. 
And because we are seeing these more extreme heats in the summer, it's really um, driven by the extreme heat and the impacts on the way the body has to protect itself during extreme heat. We have to shunt blood to, the, our, to our periphery, to our skin, so that we can use normal mechanisms for cooling the body by sweating. That takes the blood away from the brain. The oxygen levels fall in the brain. And we also know that there are profound impacts then on those those chemicals that communicate between brain cells, neurotransmitters, serotonin particularly, that are impacted and don't function as well when it's extremely heat. So I don't think of it as only summer, but it is the extreme heats that are, of course, associated with our summer seasons. Are these just short-term effects or could extreme heat have a lasting impact on our psyche as well? Kind of depends on who you are. Um, if you already are someone who has um, kind of it, uh, brain difficulties and underlying psychiatric or um, or uh, cognitive impairments due to brain illnesses, then you're more likely to have some more enduring part uh, impacts. But mostly this is the acute phases, the acute problems, but those also can be um, very significant. In general, for these kinds of symptoms, are there people that are more at risk than others or groups in society that are more vulnerable to these kinds of effects of extreme heat? Uh, none of us are going to escape feeling really crummy, but it is not uniformly felt equally across the populations. And of course, there are then some much more vulnerable populations. Infants and children are particularly uh, vulnerable. Pregnant women are very vulnerable during extreme heats. Elderly, particularly frail elderly and those with medical conditions and those who are disabled. People who are on medications, some medications make it much more difficult to control um, the body's ability to cool itself. Um, uh, people who are, and I'm gonna, as a psychiatrist, I must also underscore that psychiatric patients are at extreme risk. They die three times more than non-psychiatric patients, particularly severe mentally ill. Low income, those who have poor housing and are not able to afford decent housing that gives, us, yeah. gives them some respite. Um, uh, those who can't afford air conditioning, those who live in heat islands, uh, urban heat islands that are much more exposed to heat, yeah. outdoor workers, and the homeless. Um, we're almost at the end of the show, but I'd like to get your advice to all the people they are struggling to pull through with these hot temperatures. Plan ahead, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Find cool places. Um, use water to cool yourself down, either showering or um, wet towels around your neck. Um, consider talking to your physician about what medications you're on. Avoid al alcohol. Never, ever leave kids in a car. That was Robin Cooper from the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Joining us now from Austin, Texas, to talk more on how heat affects us all is author Jeff Godel. He's written extensively about climate change, and his most recent book is The Heat Will Kill You First. Jeff, welcome to DW. Uh, tell us, what makes extreme heat so deadly? Hi, thanks for having me. Well, you know, what makes extreme heat so deadly is you know, like all living things, human beings have thermal limits. You know, our bodies function very well within a certain narrow range of temperatures. I think all of us intuitively understand that. We all know that when we go to the doctor, the first thing the doctor does is take our temperature. And if our body temperature is even elevated slightly, it's a sign of something wrong. So maintaining this stable temperature is really important. And all it takes is sort of, you know, a, a minor change in our internal body temperature and things start going 
um, you get into danger zones very quickly. Your heart starts beating faster, trying to circulate more blood to cool off. You start sweating. And, you know, if you're in good health and you can and you can handle that kind of um, increased metabolism and stress in your body, you might be OK as long as you cool off. But if you have any kind of um, heart problems or health uh, other issues, once you're, you're it puts tremendous strain on your body. And, in, and if you don't get into a cooler space very quickly, you can be in big trouble very fast. Longer and more intense heat waves have become more common in the last year. We've had record temperatures across the board. To what extent can we humans realistically adapt to a much warmer climate? Well, I think the key word in that question is we humans, um, depending on, you know, who the we is in that sentence. Certainly wealthy people who have access to reliable air conditioning, who can e easily move around to cooler places, can thrive in, um, you know, a, a much warmer climate than people who do not have access to air conditioning, who live in un uninsulated homes, or who can't afford to pay for air conditioning, or even you know unhoused people, um, you know there's a, a big variation in this. You know Elon Musk believes people can survive on Mars, and I'm sure you can if you have billions of dollars and you know in incredible technological infrastructure. But in the real world. You know, I in my book, I call heat a predatory force, and it really is. It goes after the most vulnerable people first, outdoor workers, uh, people who don't have um, uh, air conditioning, don't have access to cool spaces. So this question of what we can survive is, you know, a question really of um, climate justice and equity. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, you wrote that we still had a chance to turn this around to avoid a climate catastrophe. Now, two years on, do you still believe that? And what in that case could be a recipe to get us out of here? Well, first of all, you know, it's be very clear that the, you know, the warming that we're seeing, these extreme heat waves, these longer of longer and longer duration and higher and higher temperatures are a direct result of burning more fossil fuels, which puts more CO2 into the atmosphere which is causing this warming. This is a very straightforward science. We've known it for you know, more than 100 years. Um, that's very clear. So the first thing you know, that we need to do is to stop burning fossil fuels. And that is the one thing that is most urgent task right now in order to maintain a kind of hospitable planet. But I also want to underscore that this is not a binary thing. This is not like we cross some threshold and all of a sudden the earth is uninhabitable or all of a sudden we're doomed. Every ton of CO2 that we eliminate from putting into the atmosphere matters. Um, it keeps it uh, keeps it cooler. We are not on a kind of um, doomsday or not kind of track. It's a question of how bad we let it get. And the sooner we take action to cut fossil fuel emissions, the, the, the cooler our future will be. Yeah. And you've traveled all over the world for your latest book. Is there one heat-related story that stuck with you the most that you could briefly tell us? Sure. I think, I think the, the story that stuck with me the most was the story of, um, uh, that I tell in my book in the opening chapter of a, of a family who went for a hike in California on, um, on a hot day. They were living in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada not far from Yosemite National Park. They knew it was going to be hot, um, but they thought they were ready. They were perfectly healthy. They were in their 30s and 40s. And um, they didn't come home that night and their families became concerned and a search party went out and they found the entire family, a, a husband and wife, a one and a half year old child and their dog dead on the trail. And after you know several weeks of investigation to find out what happened to them, it was clear that they all died of heat stroke. And, and that that was a terrible tragedy um, and a very heart-wrenching story to tell. But it really underscores how um, heat, we are all vulnerable to heat. And we are even in, in the wrong circumstances, it can kill all of us and it can kill us quickly. And I think that that's really important to underscore. This is not a future event, a future risk. This is something that we all are in danger of right now. And I think understanding the urgency of thinking about it that way, not as a future event, but as a, a, a clear and present danger is really yeah. important.
That was Jeff Goodall, author of The Heat Will Kill You First from Austin, Texas. Thank you so much. Great speaking to you. Thanks for having me.